Christ always was. From before the foundation of the earth, Christ was. From everlasting to everlasting. There was never a time when Christ was not. 2,000 years ago, the Christ that always was, that created the universe, that's what the first chapter of John says, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. 2,000 years ago, the Christ that always was took on human flesh. He had a body, a physical body. It was through that body that he came into the world to do his work, to carry out his mission. That mission is easy to understand. It's simple. He came with a mission, and that mission was to transform the world as it is into the kingdom of God. That's why he came. He taught his disciples to pray for that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? That, that was weak. This is not a Pentecostal gathering here tonight. Let's try that one more time. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. That's right. I want you to get that message. Christ, that always was, had a physical body, and through that physical body, he lived out love, he brought hope, he brought joy to a world that needed him, but most of all, he started a movement that would transform the world that is into the world that ought to be. Christ was among us. He comes to his disciples and he says, Now, men, listen to me. I'm going to leave you. Read that in the 14th chapter of John. I'm going to leave you. But if I leave you, I will come again. And I will be in you. The disciples panic at this. They had expected that he would create the kingdom. And that he would be the king. They expected that he would reestablish the throne of David. And rule over Israel. And drive out those Italians. We're the ones with the pink flamingos on the front lawn, in case you don't know. And he says, I'm leaving you. And when he says, I'm leaving you, they panic. He said, if you knew why I was leaving you, you would not be upset. Quite the opposite, he says in John. If you knew why I was leaving you, you would be thrilled. For if I leave you, I will come again, and I will be in you. Now, there's a big difference between Jesus being with us and Christ being in us. Agreed? I mean, Christ is always with us. But whether or not he is in us has everything to do with whether or not we will receive him into our lives. That's the way I pray in the morning. Every morning for me is a time for receiving Christ. I mean, sometimes people think that's a one-for-all thing. I was in an airport in Richmond, Virginia, and there was a kid working the crowd with the four spiritual laws, and he got to this elderly guy, this elderly African-American man, looked very much like John Perkins. Old, dignified, heavy, smiling, sound asleep. <laughs> he hit the guy on the knee, and the guy woke up. He said, well, well, what is it? He said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? The old guy said, yeah, I think I'm saved. I suppose I'm saved. Yeah, I guess I'm saved. He said, that's not good enough. Can you tell me exactly when you were saved? The old guy said, well, not exactly. It was almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and then he added, just found out about it recently. That Jesus Christ is your Savior is a done deal. When he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he took the punishment for your sins. Your sins are buried in the deep sea. They are blotted out because of what he did back there and then 2,000 years ago. Amen? Amen? That's right. I mean, he shall present you on judgment day to the Father faultless. And I, I like that. Because I can just imagine him saying, Father, I want you to meet my friend Tony. The perfect one. <laughs> I, I, I hope my wife's there. I, I really hope she's there. She'll probably say, well, you don't know him like I know him. But there's something more than what Jesus did for us in accepting the doctrinal truth that on the cross he took away our sins, he, he took the punishment for our sins. There's more to it than that. Every day I receive Jesus anew. 
Every day I wake up in the morning and open myself up and wait for the Holy Spirit to invade, to penetrate, to saturate my being. Every morning, my prayer time is a time of surrender. You know, if all you do in your prayer time is ask God for stuff, you're no different than my little boy when, when Bart was seven years old coming in one night and saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? Truth. If that's all your prayer life is, you are in trouble, people. You are in trouble. It's deeper than that. Every morning I surrender and I yield to the Holy Spirit. When I was a boy, I had to go to Sunday evening service. My mother made me go. And I grew up in West Philadelphia. When those guys were up there doing a the thing, I know that stuff, man. I'm West Philadelphia boy. I still belong to Mount Carmel Baptist Church, 58th and Race Street in West Philadelphia. I'm a West Philadelphia boy. And the way you survive in Philadelphia is by learning how to walk. You know? I mean, I mean, you don't have to be tough. I never got in a fight the whole time I was in high school. And I went to West Philadelphia High, the only high school I know of that had an obituary column in the school paper. <laughs> but you've got to know how to walk if you're going to stay out of fights. You intimidate people by your walk. You know, you walk down the street, cool, man. You stare people down. What are you looking at? You've got to be cool when you walk. That's why you people get mugged when you come to Philadelphia. You don't know how to walk. You walk down the street with that big Chicago smile. We kill people like you. You gotta, you gotta walk tough, man. And I'd come into church walking tough. And I'd sit down, tough. And the minister would say, does anybody have a favorite? He always did that on Sunday nights. And Mrs. Kirkpatrick would always say, 122 in the Tabernacle Hymnal. I'm tough, man. And I don't want to sing 122 in the Tabernacle Hymnal. I come to the garden alone. <laughs> while the dew is still on the roses. The second verse is even worse. I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying to be macho. And I'm singing, he speaks in the sound of his voice. It's so sweet. The birds hush their singing. Every Sunday night, I thought I was going to puke. But that's because I was 15 years old. The older I get, the older I get, the more I love to sing 122 in the Tabernacle Hymn. The older I get, the more I love to sing. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And that's what I do in the morning. I go to the garden. Figuratively speaking, I go to the still place, the quiet place. And in the garden of prayer, I wait for the Holy Spirit to invade me. Wait, wait, wait. When was the last time you waited for Christ to invade you? When was the last time you waited? You all know the verse from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, they who wait upon the Lord. But when was the last time you waited for something to happen? Wait for that spirit of Christ to invade, to flow into you, to be in you. Christ said to his disciples, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to come back. And if you will receive me, as many as will receive him, to them he gives this power. And in quietude in the morning I surrender and Christ comes in me. And Christ can come into each one of us. And you know what happens? The same Christ that was incarnated in Jesus comes into your body and into mine. You say, wait a minute, Campolo. I'm quite willing to affirm the doctrine that Jesus is the incarnation of the eternal Christ. I am quite ready to accept that Jesus was the body in whom the eternal Christ was present in the world. But you're not suggesting that we are the body of Christ. You know, I read that somewhere. I read it in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians in the 27th verse. Ye are the body of Christ. You say, wait a minute, it's not the same thing. Here's what it says in the 8th chapter of Romans. And the same spirit that was in Christ Jesus and raised him from the dead, that same spirit shall be in your mortal bodies. Now, let me point out something. 
When Christ was incarnated in Jesus, he could only connect with one person at the time. If he was looking into the face of Martha, he wasn't looking into the face of John. If he was looking in the face of John, he wasn't looking in the face of Mary. If he was looking in the face of Mary, he was not looking into the face of Peter. Eyeball to eyeball, person to person, he could only intimately connect with one person at the time. But what is there, a couple of thousand of us here? If Christ, if the same Christ that was alive in Jesus is alive in each one of us, all 2,000 of us, how many people could he love at any given moment? Answer is obvious. 2,000. No wonder he said to his disciples, and because I leave you and I will come back and be in you, the work that I do, loving people, changing people, transforming the world into the kingdom, the work that I do, ye shall do. And because there are 2,000 of you here, you will be able to do even greater works than I did because I was only one and you were 2,000 and the same spirit that is in me shall be in you. You say, well, well, I don't act like Jesus. No, and it's about time you start trying. <laughs> Christ lived out love. And that's what we are all called to do. When you get it down to the bottom line, it's more than technique. It's more than just knowing the right sociological methodology. If Christ is in you, he will generate a love that is real and people will sense the reality of that even if you're stupid and don't know what you're doing. <laughs> they know love when it's real. They know love when it's real. They also know phony people. And so many of us who go into the city are phony do-gooders instead of people who are possessed by Christ and through whom Christ is reaching out in love to those around us. He came to bring a kingdom that was marked by love, also by joy. I love that. You know, it's all about joy, too. I wonder how many of us bring joy into our neighborhoods. Sometimes we who are involved in inner city ministry get very heavy, very serious, very profound. Jesus said, my kingdom is likened unto a wedding feast. Jesus was Jewish, which is the next best thing to being Italian. People often say, why didn't he come as an Italian? Because the Bible said he came to humble himself. <laughs> but Jews, Italians, Arab peoples, Greeks, we all have one thing in common. All of us who live around the Mediterranean area, we have this in common. We know how to do a wedding feast. I don't know how many of you have been to a, an Italian wedding. How ah, many of you? An Italian funeral, that'll do. The only difference between an Italian wedding and an Italian funeral is that there's one less person at the Italian funeral. That's... <laughs> but we know how to have weddings, man. We mortgage the house. We take the money out of the bank. We have a blowout to end all blowouts. And Jesus says, you want to know what my kingdom's like? My kingdom is like an unto a wedding feast. Oh, that's a great image. And that's what we are obligated to bring into the communities that we serve. An air of celebration, joyful celebration. I don't want heavy 12 people say, I'm here to serve Jesus. I was in a church. It was a, I don't want to knock the Presbyterians. But it was a Presbyterian church just a few weeks ago. And I did my best. I pulled out all the stops. I tried to get some reaction from the congregation. Nothing. <laughs> On the way out, a lady said, Oh, Dr. Campolo, you were so humorous. I almost laughed out loud. <laughs> Gee. Gee. We are to bring laughter and celebration and joy. I mean, Jesus comes to town, he's walking down Main Street, and, and this guy named Zacchaeus who ripped off everybody in the community, everybody hates his guts. He's a short guy, he tries to push through the crowd to see Jesus, but they won't let him through. So you know the song, he climbed up in the sycamore tree. Remember this? For he wanted his Lord to see. You know the song? At last the Savior came walking. He looked up in and he said, Zacchaeus, you're a dirty, filthy sinner and you're going to burn in hell forever. <laughs> That's not what he said. 
He said, yo, Zach, come down. We're coming to your house today. We're going to have a party. So the next time they ask you in your community, what time is it you're going to say it's? That's it. It's all about celebration. I mean, there's the good Samaritan. And there's the, not better than that, the prodigal son. There's the guy. Takes half of his father's money. Goes off to some wicked city like Chicago and <laughs> wastes his money in riotous living. And when it's all gone, he ends up feeding pigs. And he says to himself, what am I doing here? There are people in my father's farm back in Pennsylvania. They have good jobs. They, they get decent pay. They, I'm going to go home to my father. Now, after you blow half of your father's money, you'd better rehearse your speech. All the way home, he's practicing. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of your hired servants. Over and over, he's practicing it. The Bible says that the father sees him when he's a long way off, goes out, runs his arms around him. The kid starts to speak, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. Father's not living. Harry, get some robes. This kid's in rags. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Get a ring. Put it on his finger. Make me one. Shut up, kid. Out behind the barn. Hey, John. There's a fat calf. Kill that sucker. We're going to have a... And then, of course, there's the older brother. There's always an older brother. They usually elect him to the Board of Deacons. Can't you just hear him? Been faithful. Been faithful here. Not like this brother of mine. Faithful in season. Been out of season. Nobody ever threw a party for me. No wonder. <laughs> Father puts his arms around him and says, Son, I love you just as much as I love my other boy. Come on. This is your brother who was lost and is found, was dead and is alive. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate, celebrate. I uh, had to go on a speaking engagement to Honolulu. <laughs> hey, sometimes you get Chicago, sometimes you get Honolulu. <laughs> You go to Honolulu, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're from the East Coast because of the time difference, and I, I was hungry. I went looking for something to eat up a side street. I found a greasy spoon. I went in. There were no booths, just a row of stools in front of the counter. I sat down. There was nobody in the place. I, I didn't touch the menu. It was one of those plastic menus, you know, and grease had piled up on it. I knew that if I opened the thing, something extraterrestrial would have crawled out. <laughs> this fat guy with a greasy apron, unshaved, cigar comes out, puts the cigar down and says, what do you want? I said, a cup of coffee and a donut. He poured the coffee and then he did this. <laughs> and he picked up the donut. <laughs> I hate that. So I'm sitting there, 3.30 in the morning, munching on my dirty donut, <laughs> went into this place, come about 10 or 11 prostitutes. And they sat on either side of me. And it was a small place. And I tried to disappear. The one next to me was especially boisterous, and she said to her friend, tomorrow's my birthday, I'm going to be, I'm going to be 39. And her friend said, so what do you want me to do? Sing happy birthday? So you're going to be 39. You want a cake? You want a party? First woman said, look, I don't want anything. I'm just telling you it's my birthday. Why do you have to hurt my feelings? And then she added, I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. I don't expect to have one now. That did it. I waited until they left. And then I called to Harry over. I said, do they come in here every night? He said, yeah. I said, the one right next to me. He said, Agnes. I said, it's her birthday tomorrow, Harry. What do you say? We decorate this place. And when she comes in tomorrow night, we have a little party for her. She's never had a party in her whole life. He grabbed my hand and squeezed it and said, Mister, that's beautiful. Beautiful. She ain't come out here. This guy wants to throw a birthday party for Agnes. It's her birthday tomorrow. She came out and she said, Oh, Mister, that's brilliant. 
Nobody ever does anything for Agnes, and she's one of a, the good people in this town. I know, I know what she does to make money, but she's a good person. I said, can I decorate the place? She said, to your heart's content. I said, I'm going to bring a big birthday cake. Harry said, oh, no, the cake's my thing. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So I got there the next morning at about 2.30. I had bought this crepe paper at, uh, at uh, the Kmart. I strung it across the place. I made a big sign, Happy Birthday, Agnes, put it on the mirror behind the counter. I had the place spruced. It was ready. Jan, who did the cooking, had gotten the word out on the street. By 3.15, every single prostitute in Honolulu was squeezed into this diner. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes. And me! 3.30 in the morning, the door opens. In comes Agnes and her friends. I've got everybody set, everybody ready. As they come to the door, we yell, Happy Birthday, Agnes! And start cheering like mad. I've never seen anybody so stunned in my life. Her knees buckled. They studied her. They got her down on a stool and we started singing, Happy Birthday, Happy Birthday, Happy Birthday to you. And they brought out the cake with the candles. That was it. She lost it and started to cry. Harry just stood there with the cake, with all the candles. Said, knock it off. Come on, Magnus, knock it off and blow out the candles. Come on, blow out the candles. She tried, but she couldn't do it, so he blew out the candles. <laughs> he gave her the knife and said, now cut the cake. Come on now, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. She sat for a long moment, and then she turned to me and she said, Mr., I really don't want to cut the cake. Is it okay if I don't cut the cake? I said, it's your cake. It's your cake. You can do with it what you want. She said, I want to take it home. I want to show it to my mother. Is that okay? I said, sure. She stood up. I said, do you have to do it now? <laughs> she said, I live two doors down. Let me take the cake to her. And, and I promise I'll bring it right back. I promise. She picked up the cake like it was the Holy Grail. And she pushed her way through the crowd and out the door. And as the door swung slowly shut, there was dead silence. You talk about an awkward silence. All of us were just standing there, stunned. I didn't know what to say, so I, I finally said, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say we pray? Weird looking back on it now. <laughs> a sociologist leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner at 3.30 in the morning. It was the right thing to do. And I prayed that God would deliver her from what filthy men had done to her, probably starting when she was, she was too young to even know what was going on. That's how these things start, you know. Some kid, 11, 12 years old, gets messed over by some filthy slob and and her self-image is destroyed and she's ruined and we blame her when we ought to be blaming him. And I prayed that God would make her new because we're here to declare the good news that no matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus can make you new. When I finished the prayer, Harry leaned across the counter and said, Hey, Camp Paulo, you told us you were a sociologist. You're a preacher. <laughs> what kind of church you preach in? And in one of those moments, when you come up with just the right words, I said, I, I, I preach in a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'll never forget his response. Never. He said, no, you don't. No, nah, you don't. He said, I would join a church like that. Wouldn't we all, wouldn't we all love to belong to a church that threw birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning? I got news for you. I got news for you. That is the kind of church that Jesus came to create. I don't know where we got this other one that's half country club. But Jesus came to create a people that would bring parties to those who have no parties, celebration into the lives of uh, people who have nothing to celebrate. If all you've got to offer is a bowl of soup and some clothes, it's not enough. 
Jesus came and said, I have come that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. And we've got to do more than just give them bread and clothes. We've got to bring love and joy into their lives. I'm not minimizing the other sides of things. That's why at, uh, we have this uh, graduate program to train people to do urban youth ministry because it's a very specialized kind of a thing. But, but most recently, we've decided to revitalize a, a program. You got that little folder and it said International Economic Development. We've been sending young people to the third world for years. They've graduated from a program that we have that trains people and how to start small businesses and cottage industries for poor people in third world countries. It's, it's quite incredible. I remember the first business we started. It was, a, it was a factory where we made sandals out of old, worn out automobile tires in Santa Domingo, the Dominican Republic. We gave the boys and girls 50 cents every time they brought to the women who ran this factory worn out, discarded automobile tires. People, it wasn't long before we had every worn out, discarded automobile tire in Santa Domingo. Then we started getting a lot of new automobile tires. God works in strange and mysterious ways. We've been feeding a lot of our graduates into an organization called Opportunity International. Over the last 15 years, Opportunity International in the third world has created three and a half million jobs for poor people. Three and a half million jobs. Now, we, we, what we decided to do now is to do it here in the United States because you don't have to go to the third world to go to the third world anymore. I mean, two miles from here across the river in Camden is the third world. 36% unemployment rate. 93% of all the children born in Camden last year were born out of wedlock. If you go to Camden High School, there's less than a 50% probability you'll graduate. And if you graduate, at least a third of those who do graduate are functionally literate. One out of every 12 houses in Camden is deserted. People just moved out. They couldn't sell it. They just left. It's a city of 80,000. 10,000 people come in every day to buy drugs. If you're 12 years old in Camden, New Jersey, there's a 47% probability that you'll spend two years in jail before you're 25. You don't have to go to the third world to go to the third world. And so he said, you know, we've been creating small businesses and, and cottage industries for people in the third world. We've got to do it in Philadelphia and Chicago. We've got to do it in Philadelphia. We've got to do it in these places. Now, you've got to understand something. I love what the government does when it tries to do economic development. But I've got news for you. Nobody can do it like the church. Nobody. You see, the ideal mindset for somebody in an economic development program is to have a merger of Pentecostal Christianity with Calvinistic theology. So you've got to be Pentecostal. You get a group of women together, and you get them praying. You get them reading the scripture. You, the problem with poor people, and, and you, heard, you heard Brooke Sexton talk about it, the problem with poor people is that they don't have a good self-concept. They don't think they're worth anything. They, the society has made them feel rotten. They're precious, but that's not the way they feel. And if things are real in the imagination, says W.I. Thomas, they are real in their consequences. You get a group of Pentecostal women together, and they start praying. If they come up with an idea, they won't attribute it to themselves, and that's a good thing, because they have no confidence in their own ideas. But if they're Pentecostal and they come up with an idea, they're convinced that it's not their idea. If they're really Pentecostal, they're sure the idea came from... God. Amen, man. And, and, and God's ideas always work. Can't you just hear them at this prayer meeting? We're going to start this business. And it's going to succeed because with God... What things are possible, people? i got to tell you, we can do all things through... Who does what? Amen. Now you're getting into the mode, people. You're getting into the mode. 
What's more is the people who are here who are in our economic development program will tell you that sooner or later every economic development project that you start in the inner city among the poor is going to run into difficulty and into financial trouble. There will be a cash flow problem. There will be a marketing problem. There will be some kind of problem. But if you're poor, at that point you get discouraged and give up and say, well, what made us ever think that we could succeed anyway? We, people made fun of us when we started. They're so down on themselves that when they run into trouble, they give up. Unless they're Pentecostal. Because if they're Pentecostal, they don't attribute the hard things that are happening to them, the trouble that they've run into on themselves. They don't blame themselves. If you're Pentecostal, who do you blame? The devil, baby. The devil. The devil. And I'm here to preach the word, people. If you resist the devil, he will. Please. I want to hear it again. He will. Please. I mean, I know that there's an evil one out there. But greater is he that is Please. than you, he who is. Do we understand? You know, I'm, I'm making fun, but I believe this stuff. I really believe it. I really believe if you can get people praying together, filled with the Holy Spirit, they will have confidence that they otherwise would not have confidence. And I am convinced that if they are filled with the Holy Spirit, when troubles come, they won't give up. They will know that they will not be weary in well-doing, for in due season they know they will reap if they faint not. Oh, what the Holy Spirit does to some people who have no confidence in themselves. Oh, what the Holy Spirit can inspire people to do when the world gives up on them. And that's why faith-based programs are the not a good answer. They are the only answer. Because more important than starting a project here or a program there is building up people so that they believe in themselves and are convinced that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. Like I say, I'm not Pentecostal, but I talk so fast that people think I'm speaking in tongues, so it, it works out. But I believe in that Pentecostal stuff. I believe the Pentecostal movement is the greatest thing that's come down the pike. This is the hundredth year since the Yasusa prayer meeting started. Praise God, where would we be in the world today if it wasn't for the Pentecostal movement? I praise God for it. And you don't have to be Pentecostal to realize that God is doing something incredibly wonderful that, through that movement. That's why, that's why I like coming to this thing. You've got all kinds of strange people here. You've got Baptist. I'm Baptist. The difference between a Baptist and a terrorist is that you can negotiate with a terrorist. That's, that's the difference. But whether we're dealing with Baptists or Presbyterians or, or Methodists or Roman Catholics, when you come together like this, all of us realize there's great validity in each other's point of view. We can learn from each other. No one group has a whole corner on the truth. Each group of Christians here has something to teach the rest of the group. Amen? I mean, Pentecostals have their thing. The Catholics come with their contemplative praying and their Lectio Divina and all that. That's great stuff, too. I've learned from them. And the Presbyterians, they come with their theology. They're such thinking people. They scare me. And the Methodists, they just come. But you know, I not only want that, I not only want that Pentecostal spirit, I'm going to start an economic development project. I've got to do this. I want to combine it with a, with a Calvinistic theology. See, see, the Calvinists say, it's, it's, I'm sure they're going to start succeeding if they're Pentecostal. But the question is, what will they do with the money once they get it? <laughs> now, if they're Calvinists, they won't spend it. <laughs> Calvinists are not allowed to spend money. I remember taking the Grey Line tour of Chicago. Most of you have taken this tour one time or another. And my daughter was nine years old at the time. We came to this theater where... John Dillinger was gunned to death by the FBI. And the tour guide said, in that alley, they shot down the gangster, John Dillinger, having robbed over 900,000 from banks throughout the Midwest. He had spent it all on riotous living. And when they killed him, out of that $900,000, he only had 35 cents left to his name. And my daughter... My nine-year-old daughter, in a whisper that was audible to everyone on the bus, said, she said, what great timing. I mean, 
mean, you know how Presbyterians are. You're never allowed to spend the money. You've got to invest it like the guy with the talents. You've got to invest it so you'll get more money. Jeez. Worse than that. Calvinists never stop working. They're the most driven people I know. I mean, if you're Calvinist, you know what I'm talking about. On vacation, your mother wakes you up in the morning. Wake up! Your father says, it's vacation! <laughs> now, you know, I want you to be ready in an hour, and I want you to get in that car, and when you get in that car, two things will be true. The gasoline tank will be full, your bladders will be empty. And we will drive and drive and drive and drive until two things are true. The gasoline tank will be empty. And only then will your bladder be allowed to be full. What if my bladder gets full before the... May God have mercy on you. Jeez. Go, go, go. If I can put that all together, if I can get that drivenness or that work ethic of Calvinism combined with the enthusiasm of Pentecostalism, I've got an unbeatable combination. That's why I love this ecumenical movement thing. And that's why we at Eastern have started this urban economic development program. We're going to develop it into a two-year program, and we're going to get young people to come and live together in groups of six in the inner city, we're going to put them in neighborhoods where they get to know inner city people, where they become neighbors with inner city people. We're going to get them to go to church with inner city people. We get too many people to go through school and then go out. We want you to know what the city's all about before you ever go there to do anything. And by the way, we got a table downstairs, and two guys who are running this program are going to be right up here giving away stuff. And you don't have to take stuff, you understand? You don't have to. You don't have to be interested in this program. But if you're not, all the elastic in your underwear will snap before you get back to your room tonight. We are to bring love, we are to bring joy, we are to bring economic well-being, but most important of all, we are to bring Jesus Christ himself into the inner city. Now, we have to do this, people. We have to challenge others to participate. You know what scares me about this crowd? You're so young. You say, isn't that wonderful? Kind of. <laughs> I'm old. John Perkins, you're old now, too. You know you're old when your wife says, let's go upstairs and have sex, and you say, I can't do both. You know, you know you're old. You know you're old. You know you're old. You know. But I, I want to tell you, I want to tell you that old people are our most underutilized resource in urban ministry. We got these people who have a lifetime of experience, and what are they doing? They've retired, and they're playing golf. A game where you chase a little white ball because you're too old to chase anything else. Boom. Abraham was 94 when he got turned on to missions. He wanted to go into urban ministry when he was 94. Remember that? Woke up one morning, shook his wife, sir, sir, she's 92. What is it, Abe? I just, I just had a vision. Hey guys, there's a whole new approach you haven't tried before. Poor old woman. What kind of vision? We're going to create a new city, the founder of whom is God. We are going to create a new humanity, a new epoch in human history. Poor old lady. How's this new humanity start, Abe? Glad you asked, Sarah. And if you don't think God's got a sense of humor, if you don't think God's got a sense of humor, get this picture of this guy leaving the earth of the Chaldees, walking down a dusty road. Got the picture of this 94-year-old guy in a walker with his 92-year-old pregnant wife next to him. Where you going, Abe? I don't know. What are you going to do when you get there? I don't know. Why are you leaving? Because God has given me a vision. And when the old no longer have visions and the young no longer have dreams, the people perish. 
We've got to get young people like you on board, but we've got to get the old people. You've got to go to these churches, these inner city churches, have these old people who are just vegetating, waiting to die, and say, you've got to come and help us. You've got resources. You've got money. You've got time. Come, join us. We need you. I know it's fun to run around with young people because they're so cute. That band up here was so cute. I hated them. But we old people need to be enlisted. Please understand that. Please understand. You know, retirement's only talked about once in the scripture. It is specifically referred to. The certain man built a barn and filled it with stuff for retirement. And after the barn was full, he said, I don't think I have enough for retirement. You know, inflation, who knows? I'm going to rip it down. I'm going to build a bigger barn. And he built a bigger barn and it filled with more stuff for retirement. And finally, when he finished, he said, take ease, my soul. And the Lord said, thou fool, this day your soul will be required of you. I'll tell you how to keep from dying when you're old. Stay in the work of Jesus. Well, we need old people, we need young people. I really didn't mean it. We're, we're really, I'm, I'm hot to recruit people who say, I want to know how to go into the inner city and start small businesses and cottage industries and churches. Because look, churches have buildings that aren't used from Sunday to Sunday. They have offices that can serve the new businesses. You can make a church into an incubator, and you've got all these old people who have all kinds of experience to serve as consultants. You could put together magnificent work in inner city churches. They could become hundreds of incubators for small businesses and cottage industries that the poor people in that neighborhood can own and run themselves. It's possible, and we want to make it a reality. Well, that's the end of the rip except for this. I belong to Mount Carmel Baptist Church, and it's a fun church. You've been fun today. You're, you, you know, I look over this group, and it's a white group, and you acted black. I don't know what they do up here, but they make, they have de this whole congregation. See, once a year in my church in West Philadelphia, once a year they have this student recognition day. And these young African-American young people come back from universities and colleges. And it's no sermon that Sunday. They just come one by one, 40, 50 of them. One by one, they come to the rostrum and simply introduce themselves and stay where they're studying and what they're studying. Um, I'm, at, I'm at Harvard and I'm studying law. And you hear grandmothers and grandfathers going, my, my. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody else will say, I'm studying engineering at MIT. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You think you heard great music? You haven't heard the greatest music. Till you hear about 500 grandmothers and grandfathers moaning and groaning, the moans and groans of joy because their grandchildren are becoming what America never let them be. You know what I mean by that? You know what I mean by that? Their grandchildren are becoming what America never let them be. And, and they're glorying in this. And when they were all seated, bright out and bushy tail, my pastor got up and he looked at me and he said, Children! He talks like that. He said, Children, y'all going to die. You're going to die. That's a good thing to tell kids. He said, You don't think you're going to die. You're going to die. They're going to take you out to the cemetery. They're going to drop you in a hole. They're going to throw dirt in your face. And they're going to go back to the church and eat potato salad. He said, when you were born, you were the only one to cry. Everybody else was happy. That's not important. Here's what's important. When you die, will you be the only one that's happy? And everyone else will cry. That depends. That depends on what you're committed to. Right now, you're, you're committed to getting titles, doctor's degrees and bachelor's degrees and all kinds of degrees. Are you committed to getting titles? Is that what it's about, titles? Or is it about testimonies? Man, that's black preaching. White guys can't do that. That's, that's great stuff. Titles are testimonies. And then he did what only a black preacher can do. He swept through the Bible in five minutes. White guys can't do that. You've heard white guys today. We're going to exegete. The second verse of the third chapter of the This guy started in Genesis and went through Revelation in one sweep. He said there was Moses and there was Pharaoh. Pharaoh had
had the title. Good title. Ruler of Egypt, that's a good title. But when it was over, that's all he had. He had a title. But Moses had testimonies. Oh, boy. Oh, that's good. That's good. So good. There's Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. Oh, that's a good title, Queen. That's a good title, Queen. She was going to destroy Elijah the prophet of God, but when it was over, all she had was a title. She had the title, but Elijah had the... You're getting into it. I'll give you one more shot. Just one more shot. So I want to hear... There's, there's King Darius who threw Daniel into the lion's den. King Darius, good title, King. But when it was over, all he had was a title. He had a title, but Daniel had the... People of God... One of these days, they will take you out and drop you in a hole. They will throw dirt in your face and go back to the church and eat potato salad, just like my pastor said. But if you live out this calling of ministry to those who need love, to those who need a party, to those who need celebration, to those who need economic hope, in the midst of a world that's gone crazy with big corporations and has left little people behind, if you go out there and create jobs for people who need them, when it's all over, you may not have much of a title, but you'll have a whole array of people standing around your grave giving testimonies. I wish for you both titles and testimonies, but if you've got to make a choice, go for the testimonies.